As is technology loves us every so often, it goes sideways. Not to worry. Are you experiencing a toxic workplace or toxic behavior in the boardroom? That's what we're here for. Now, my name is Sigrid de Kast. I'm a book writing, publishing, and marketing specialist, and I help entrepreneurs, people in business make their dream of writing a book come true. A book that will serve you as a tangible representation of your brand and a testament to your knowledge and experience. And I have with me today, Dr. Lizzie Bernthal, a resilience specialist, confidence and leadership coach. And I'm going to ask her all about how to become resilient to toxic behavior. Lizzie, welcome. Thank you. So excited to be here. Thank you. <laughs> we got there, we got there, and we always do yeah. get there. Now, Lizzie, would you like to share a bit more about your interesting background? Because you've been 25 years in the British Army, so I can imagine that means resilience is something you have developed or always had. Tell us about that. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think I was resilient for the first moment I was born, actually, because I was born at 28 weeks with a 5% chance of survival. So I think at that moment, I said, right, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to do something here. So yes, so I think, um, yeah, nurse and a midwife by background, joined the army at the tender age of 31, which is quite late, having worked around the world as a midwife and a nurse before that. And um, always passionate about giving people a voice or, you know, whether it was patients who were fully vulnerable or, you know, having voices for women, having their children. And then it kind of morphed into supporting um, nurses as well, giving them a voice as well. However, while I ended up being global head of nursing around the world, speaking nurses about empowerment and resilience and moved into research into resilience with a PhD, I didn't have my voice in work in my in my office and one day on the 15th of April 2015 I remember it distinctly we were at the boardroom which I absolutely dreaded every month we had this awful meeting that I used to absolutely dread and my boss had undermined me one more time and I just stood up I don't know something just came over me I just stood up and said enough is enough this has to stop and Obviously, the room went silent. People looked very awkward, <laughs> looked down at their papers. And then something happened in me. I don't know what happened. My, my sense of empowerment, I didn't even realise I had, just came out. Mm. And all these words, it was all very calm, all very controlled, just came out of my body and said, right, this is it. And that set my mission to end workplace toxicity because up to that point, while I was out and about doing my stuff and feeling I loved it, it was amazing. When I was back in the office, I always questioned whether I was good enough and then realised it was nothing to do with that at all. It was simply because I was in a toxic environment where, you know, and this is why I'm so passionate about helping leaders restore their resilience and their confidence because values driven leaders who feel they're not good enough, you know, particularly directors at the top of their game are questioning their leadership. It's nothing to do with them. They're the inspiring ones. And I talk a lot about tall poppy syndrome, which I know is a very Australian thing. It is, because, it is. Yeah. Yes, I love it because it just epitomizes exactly what's going on. Mm. It's really interesting how passionately and how excitedly you are talking about this here. And look, it does come through. So something was inside of you. So I guess in a way, you know, there's this built in mission that we possibly all have, but don't really know about yeah. it. And you just, you were just able to let it come through and, and have it really show up and shine for you and take you on the path that you are now. So you've already touched on quite a few interesting points here. My first up question that I wanted to ask you is, um, you know, what, what really, when you, when you're asked, what really is toxic behavior? If I ask you describe something, like give yeah. me an example or a description, what is it really? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. I think I, I talk about toxic behavior as how it impacts on us rather than the behavior itself. 
because I think what's really interesting, one person might interpret it as banter, somebody else might interpret it as actually quite abusive, abusive toxic behaviour. So I think it is very much um, how it makes us feel. You know, whether you're in an ant antagonistic environment, whether it's knocking your self-esteem, whether it's knocking your confidence, whether you're dreading going to work in the morning, mm -hmm. whether you're waking up in the night thinking, how are you going to get through the day? Mm -hmm. You know, that Sunday morning, Sunday evening feeling, think, oh, no, it's Monday morning. It's, it's more those signs that indicate you could be in a toxic environment rather than a complete definition of toxicity, which is obviously abusive potentially abusive behavior because it's something so subtle you know sometimes it's not absolutely aggressive behavior it's the culture that you're in which is just very subtle that you don't sometimes even realize you're in a toxic environment like I didn't so so really or, or what I'm hearing just co correct me what you're saying is that toxicity is felt by the person not by the person who's putting it out there they may even think it's funny haha -ha, in some ways or they just think it's just a way of interacting with others without realizing or maybe not necessary maybe they realize it but they don't see it as toxic they just think it's I don't know just a way of communicating so when it is how I feel and I guess this is the work you're doing from what I see yeah. and heard you talk about. You're working with that person, that leader, that director, that person in the room that is feeling it to change them to what? Perceive it in a different way. Lizzie, is that how you would say it? I think what what's that, well, the way I'm passionate about it is to, yes, exactly. Leaders come to me direct particularly directors, top of their game, they come to me because they feel they're not showing up as a leader and they're frustrated with themselves. Mm -hmm. They feel, I can't, how can I call myself a director? How can I call myself a leader when I'm, I'm finding the boardroom a really intimidating place? Mm. I should be above all this. All the shoulds come in. I shouldn't let it get to me like this. I feel I'm not serving my team as powerful as I want to. And then we unpick what's really going on. And then they acknowledge, actually, it's not them. It's the environment they're in, which they, because it's it's like anything. It, when you're in that environment, you start to accept it. This is what, this is just how it is. You know, the boardroom is this sort of place. That's just, ha just have to get on with it. And then we unpick it. And actually what I do a lot, most of my, all my clients, there's something that's happened in their childhood. Yeah, it's always something in our childhood. And so that shows up 40, 30, 40 years later in the boardroom where something's happened as a child where they're told, put your hands down, don't speak up, stay quiet, you know, stay still. And then 40 years later, they can't speak up in the boardroom. So you so you you're saying that it's actually male men as much as women. I mean, I know it from from women a lot that they feel that way that they are being almost attacked in a way, and they call it you know that's toxic behavior. The way that comes across, they yeah. feel it. But you're saying men absolutely men men by women, women by men. It is not it's not, not gender specific at all. Right. So yeah. I, I fully get what you're saying. It comes from our background somewhere in the early childhood. I was just revisiting some material that I read many years ago. And, you know, it talks about that first seven years and how it shapes. Yes, absolutely. Mm, yes. And, and I really, I, I mean, I can feel that in many areas for myself too. So we have this shaping there. So what makes the person behaving toxic in that way what makes them that way what sort of background yeah. would they have there to show that see I find this fascinating because I talk a lot about uh, our wounds which is our ego and our and our intuition our genius which is you know from love mm -hmm. so generally anyone that behaves in a toxic way they are going from their wound and I know it sounds, might, might sound a bit woo-woo, but they have had something in their life, generally, well, always from their childhood, that's made them think, I have to be, I have to be almost aggressive in order to survive. 
I, I have to behave like this because this is my protection mechanism. Mm. Because I find as soon as I address all of us, if we address someone with toxic behavior, it just vanishes because suddenly it's like they've been bubbled. And so I think the challenge is for so many of us is when we feel we're under attack and we is, is to stay above all that. And I talk a lot about what's something called the drama triangle, which is where we take on these roles from um, adult parent child, but the adult, the parent becomes like a persecutor and the child becomes like a victim. Now, I didn't realize a lot of my life I'd been a victim and didn't even realize it. So I was I was absolutely up to being attacked because every post I had, I had a tricky boss. Now that what I realized this cannot be coincidental. There's something in me that I was giving out, which I didn't even realize. So that just, so we kind of emanate that because yeah. of our, so you're calling it the wound. And would it be also correct perhaps to call it that's a make the survival mechanism? Yeah, absolutely. Developed, yeah. So, so, so people who, you know, had this uh, feeling that oh, I've got to stand up there and I've got to show I'm strong yeah. and, and they become this toxic person, they, that's their survival mechanism. That's how they think it has to happen. While on the other hand, Mika people, I mean, I, I, I would call myself a Mika. I don't, I don't like yeah. confrontation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know I sort of stand back and say oh this is terrible um and so it's just how we individually deal with these background issues and often mm -hmm. don't even know about it so in your work and from what I saw you really have this vision and mission to bring this topic out there yes because Absolutely. does yeah. it help Lizzie when people first know about that this exists that they can identify it easier and do something about it yeah I, th I think what's fascinating is I think what I, well, I found really sad is that there is so much toxicity and I'm all about positivity so I don't mean this in a negative way there's so much toxic culture within particularly the corporate world that it's accepted that's just how it is opposed to thinking actually we can change it now my mission is is to help leaders and or directors own their resilience own their confidence own their awesomeness their greatness within because when you show up powerfully it just doesn't exist it just you just don't tolerate it mm. so that's my mission doing it from helping every director leader I meet to help them own who they are own everything within them and then they start they're the ripple in the pond and therefore toxicity is just not tolerated and I do have a bit of a theme where um you know clients come to me and they either get headhunted because suddenly they show up powerfully differently in the boardroom because I think right I'm not tolerating this anymore and they watch it almost like a game going on around them or they just say right I'm a going. I, I, I hadn't even realized this is a toxic. I'm out. And I think that's really sad when you feel you have to leave in order to survive, mm. opposed to let's just make this better. Mm. So, what would, so would your first step for people who feel they're in a toxic environment, whether they're male or female, whether they are a director themselves or part of a, you know, of a, a larger yeah. culture in a, in a corporation somewhere on the yeah. board, and they feel this is toxic here. What What's the first thing that you want them to do? Is it to go and seek help or is it to just acknowledge, hang on, there is something wrong. It's not yeah. me. What would be the first step? Yeah, the first thing I do is I have obviously have a conversation with them mm. and um, I find out a lot about their backgrounds, you know, and, you know, what was your childhood like? What went on? How was your relationship with your parents? Um, you know, I, and I think the other thing that I find fascinating is, is where in the, in the order of child are you now often it's the eldest because the eldest has 
by definition often parent you know your mother says oh can you go and get a nappy for me or whatever so they become responsible from a much earlier age as the eldest child and sometimes it's something as simple as they were the what their they were their parents world a sibling comes along and they're pushed aside not intentionally mm. but just suddenly they're everything's focusing on the newborn baby which is totally understandable <laughs> and but as a child aged three two three can think I don't matter anymore yeah that it, it, it actually <laughs> that's something I I discovered in my own life this this moment in time where I felt well why not me why my brother yeah. who's younger <laughs> yeah Exactly yeah. that. But let me do a very quick recap. I think it's always good to remind what you've already shared because it's so important. So really what you're saying is this toxic behavior that is shown by people, it's not gender specific, can be male or female or whatever. It isn't gender specific. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's not. Okay. Yeah. And it always comes back to how we feel, how we perceive something comes back to our background, our child background, something yeah. happened, yeah. whether we realize that or not. And like with myself, I did not realize that until very late in my life when it was pointed out, like what you are doing with your clients, you need to know that. So when a person is in the situation that they are feeling this is just toxic here and they come yeah. to you, you can take it straight away from the moment of asking them lots of questions forward. What do the people feel like when you discover with them together, when they discover with you, oh, that's what happened to me. What happens there to the person in that moment? Yeah, it's just a complete light bulb moment. Mm. And at what is so wonderful is it's suddenly all the dots in their life just join up mm. and they realize that actually where they've been thinking they're not good enough all it is is collecting evidence from that viewpoint that they're not good enough and then suddenly completely flipping that and thinking no that was just you had those lenses on there yeah that I'm not good enough so no wonder I got divorced I'm not good enough no wonder I didn't get that job I'm not good enough no wonder it took me three times to pass my driving test you know all, all these things that have happened in their life mm -hmm. and suddenly they realize it's because of that one or two three moments in their childhood now of course there are times when it is you know quite traumatic stuff that they're talking about Sometimes it's just a teacher told them to put their hand down in a maths class. Right, right. Yeah, don't speak up, you know, give somebody else a chance to speak. You're always putting your hand up. Yeah. Um, <sighs> so, so it is the most rewarding thing because then suddenly light bulbs go off and then, then, but then, then we can start doing the real, real great work of, you know, helping them identify their values because often, are their values, their vision, their purpose, you know, unpick those stories, reframe that thinking about those stories. And, um, and, and this helps them align with their truest self. It get, helps them get rid of that body armor they feel they've got to put on in order to get into work. They become true to themselves because we all want to fit in. It's all part of being part of the tribe. However, Fitting in is the opposite of belonging. Yes. Because, yes. Yeah, exactly. So once they start to belong to who they, tr their true essence of who they are, just, they don't need the body armor anymore. And then they show up more powerfully than they've ever done before because they're unleashed. They're not like with a handbrake on. So Lizzie, when they are, they're going through working with you and they realize what's actually caused that whenever that happened in their life. And they really unleashing their true self, not having to conform to what's happening. How does that look in the place where they before felt the opposite of that, where they now step out and they are them? How does that how does that transform the surrounds? Does it transform the surrounds? Yeah. So what what happens to them? I have several clients. You know, one client I had, he got promoted twice during the program simply because 
he suddenly showed up in the boardroom, having been really nervous and you know, getting two days of no sleep, thinking, you know, worried about it. Then suddenly, well, okay, I'm here. This is what I've got to say. Boom. And the direct, the CEO said, I need the, you, I need you on my board. Because he just suddenly showed up. Mm. Powerfully. So and it's, then he's headhunted. Yeah, yeah, right. So it's this, it, it's almost like an energy. I mean, <clears throat> yes, I don't want to take it off the path here, but it's like, uh, it to feel to me like, wow, if I have that energy that I know what I, I know, and I go out there with that, things change. Yeah, so they become the ripper in the pond. Wow. And, and then that's when, and then they start having empowered choices. That's the mm -hmm. difference. Up to that point, they don't feel they have a choice. Then everything is a choice. Even if we choose not to have a choice, we've chosen not to have a choice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. So then they think, right, I've got choice now. Do I carry on here? Or do I, I'm worth so much more than this. I'm going to go elsewhere. Yeah, right. And, and so they have that empowered choice then rather than feeling I'm not good enough well I'm never getting anything else I just got to tolerate this got to just get on with it and what makes me so sad is that I believe everyone is truly awesome and it's so sad when you hear so many stories that individuals don't acknowledge that mm. because they haven't had that understanding and that awareness so they're going through life feeling life's a challenge when having a conversation can just transform everything that's it, it's just amazing and you know when you're talking about everybody's awesome I I mean I feel like that when it comes to writing a book people I think nearly everybody has this dream most people yeah. have this dream but they stop themselves because of yeah. reasons that you've mentioned around the toxicity I'm not good enough it's it's going around in the yeah. back of their mind but you're saying it can be overcome it needs to be worked on with somebody who is a professional in that field which is what yeah. you are doing so in all of this work do you feel that your background is a part of guiding people not just through the business corporate scenario but that the perhaps the nursing side of things may have an influence here as well in how you help people yeah, definitely. I think that partly because I've experienced all this myself, mm -hmm. you know, I've, had, I've been in Afghanistan I'm in all sorts of very dodgy places where I've had to use my resilience. And actually, I've been in toxic environments in those extraordinary, extreme environments as well. Mm. So I have kind of I've lived it and breathed it, which means that I can really relate to what they're going through. And I think you cannot underestimate the power of lived experience as well as research and understanding and knowledge and and so forth so I get where they're at because I was there too and I always think the great power of coaching is that I'm and I'm learning every day we all learn till the day we die we're learning every day all I'm just on the journey a little bit further on than they are and I think this is where it's so important because to be relatable, to understand. I never ever tell anyone, this is what you need to do. All it is is, okay, let's just work through this together because I've been there. I know how horrible it feels. I can never imagine what your life is like because obviously we all have a different life. Mm. However, I can relate to what it feels like. It might feel different for you, but I know what that feels like and what it's like to wake up at four o'clock in the morning wondering how you're going to get through the day. Incredible. So what I'm hearing here is that really your background certainly has a lot to do with it. Yes, sure. You feel you were always a resilient person, but that area of nursing and certainly the army has given you that additional or that you know outside view that really can help people in the toxic environment to get from you to learn from you and to follow your guidance to get out of that so when we are talking and using that word resilient yes you describe that uh, is there a particular yes. description 
Yeah, I think for me, are we all all to, it's overcoming adversity. Uh, we, I think that's sort of quite a common definition of it. Mm-hmm. I think what I where my definition is slightly different to lots of others is that we hear a lot about about bouncing back. I always talk about bouncing forward. I like because, that because we're never the same person as we were before the event. So if we think of us all the last three years. You know, if we if we in March 2020, when we went into lockdown in the UK, if we said all we were going to have to deal with over the next, well, you know, three years, so certainly the next following six months, we would have said, whoa, no, thanks very much. I'm not going to manage all that. And yet we have and we are always more resilient than we could ever imagine, as has we've as proved mm. over the last few years. So I think that might it's it is it's the. It's the overcoming the the top the adversity. But I think the other thing that's so important about it, it's trusting ourselves, trusting that we have everything within us to cope with whatever comes towards us. And I totally believe we are never given more than we can handle, even though at the time it might feel we have, even at the time we might feel, oh, I can't, this is just too much. Mm. We survive. So we can deal with it. So it's having that confidence within ourselves that I'll get through this. We'll all get through this. I I think you've just, first of all, I really love bouncing forward. I mean, that is something I just fear that is exciting. It's positive, And it just makes so much sense to be in the here and now not to look back not to want to go back but to want to go forward to step out of what we're in the energy let's just go let's just deal with it just yeah come Uh, on (laughs) absolutely and trusting ourselves now I want to ask you there and it's not that I want to bring it on to gender but I'm just curious is trusting ourselves is there a difference between the genders that one will be more likely to trust themselves than another or has nothing to do with that either with gender certainly from my experience with the clients I work with it makes no difference okay it's responding to how what's happened in your childhood and how and I think what's what we all is the fact that how we respond is a very individual thing but I think we all know that actually somebody's um greatest moment is somebody else's biggest tragedy so redundancy is a classic example for one person they might feel that the whole world is ended for them another thing might feel oh wow this is the most exciting time I've always wanted to set up my own business now's my time I've got and thank goodness I've been got rid of because now I can live the life I want to live so it's all down to how we frame things and that is not gender specific at all no no I get that the way you're explaining that it really does make sense and I do sometimes wonder when this gender thing comes into various areas of behavior and how we think and how we do things I think sometimes it is perhaps looked at from a a different angle not necessarily the angle that we can really do something about it certainly from what you are describing if we if we were to look at a, a bit of a summary how you describe the resilience to overcome toxicity at the workplace or at the boardroom give us a summary around that please if you can yes so I think it's owning your greatness within that I mean I think this is all and that takes some unpicking sometimes and that's why we have these conversations mm-hmm. because it's all about the individual because uh, it's like anything every every culture is created by a selection of individuals now of course the most important person is the ceo because he he or she um you know directs the culture i think where i would say about the gender thing the reason it has a bad press it's mostly men it's often because still it's more more men that are in the boardroom that's it Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's not it's not a gender thing. It's just that you're ex- we're exposed to generally more men in higher positions than women. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. That totally makes sense. I think that's what I yeah. mean. I said it's it depends on the angle you're looking at it. That's probably yeah. absolutely it. So great, great recap on that. Now to be resilient, 
do you have a particular tip around that? I know you have a fantastic tool that people can test their resilience yes. or that their, their explain it. I don't want to yes. say the wrong yes. way. Yes, yes. So I've got, I mean, I can very much share with you. Um, I have a tox, uh, resilience to toxicity scorecard. It's literally 20 questions that takes under two minutes. It's quick, 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 no thinking, just answer. And that, that can give you a score as to how um, resilient or not you are in that moment. And then after that, I always give a free um, conversation after that to sort of say, okay, this is what you, you can do to help yourself here. This is what you can do to help yourself there. But I think the most important thing is just acknowledging. And I, I talk a lot about body language. I talk a lot about, you know, just literally how, just notice how you're holding your body. Mm. Because if when we're when we're scared, we kind of like crunch up. When we're confident and empowered, we open our body up. Yeah. And so literally by sitting in the boardroom and noticing what you're doing with your body can make you feel more confident. Are you sitting up right in the chair? If you can stand up, then stand up, you know, because by standing, you're naturally much more confident, you know. So Having walking meetings, if you're making a phone call, stand up when you make that call uh, because your energy, we're much more grounded when our feet are sort of on the floor. Mm. And that is the language, it's a whole other, other topic. But yeah, are you using empowering or disempowering languages? language? So are you saying, yes, I can do it or no, I can't? So we have got the tools within ourselves. If always. We know, yeah. Always. Always. Stimulation to find them by someone like you, of course, helps greatly. But definitely take action. If you are in such an environment that is unhealthy, that you can feel is making you feel not good, uneasy to do something about it. I love the idea to use your posture. That is one small thing, although it might be difficult for some people to start with, but it's breathe in, stand up tall. I'm only a short person, so something for me to think about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love that you have given us some fantastic tips here, explained what really toxicity is, where it comes from, the different ways of looking at resilience within ourselves and working on that. Definitely from where I stand, probably something to get some outside support, some help, some guidance as you offer. And I love that you have a score card. That is something great. And we'll put the link out there to make sure people can access that and have a look at that. Because I think the more people take advantage of something like that, the more they can get started on this journey to resilience against toxicity. What would be some parting words you like to leave the audience, the listener with? Today. You're way more resilient and you have far more confidence than you ever believe you have. It's just having a conversation to acknowledge it. Fantastic. I thank you so much, Dr. Lizzie Bernthal. That's thank you. absolutely exciting and so much truth and so much new things to do and to understand sharing what you know from your particular background that is just great as a resilience specialist, confidence and leadership coach coming to you and making sure we go and get that particular scorecard. I love it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. It's such a joy to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, thank you for anyone here that's listening and I'm here to support. So wonderful. Great.